Good morning and welcome to Science Says. Good afternoon for those of you who are not in the uh, Pacific time zone, but it's great to be with everyone today. Our topic is Back to the Future, Navigating Work, School, and Well-Being in a World Transformed by COVID-19. My name is Tom Lynch. I'm the President and Director and the Raise Beck Endowed Chair here at the Fred Hutch, and I could not be happier uh, to be with everyone today. Thank you so much uh, for spending this hour with us. Before we start on today's topic, which will easily fill our hour, and I'm sure will fill up the question and answer box quite, quite quickly, I wanted to share some exciting news. Now, many of you may have seen this either in the national cancer media or in the Seattle press, for those of you who live in the Puget Sound area. Uh, but about three weeks ago, the Fred Hutch and our Seattle Cancer Care Alliance partners, the University of Washington Medicine and Seattle Children's, announced that we're exploring a restructure to bring research and patient care closer together to create the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. We're extremely excited, excited about this because this new organization will bring together the people, programs, and facilities of the Fred Hutch and the SCCA into one remarkable organization. We believe by doing this, we will enhance our basic science, our clinical science, and our translational science capabilities while creating the world's finest place to be treated for cancer across a broad spectrum of cancers, including areas that we have always innovated in, like bone marrow transplant and the treatment of leukemia. And we'll continue our leading edge research uh, programs, both at the Fred Hutch, as well as UW Medicine and Seattle Children's, which will be our partner in our Comprehensive Cancer Center grant. Now, we're still very much in the planning stages, but if all goes well, we would hope the change would happen in the early part of 2022. Um, this is great news for patients. It's great news for Seattle and Puget Sound. And I think it's great news uh, for cancer uh, patients globally at this point. I'll be happy to answer any questions about this during the Q&A um, if, you, if you'd like to, to ask those at this point. But let's get to today's topic, which is about COVID. Now we called this, titled this one, Back to the Future. And, and I think it's really important to, to point out that um, life has gotten better, but it's certainly not back to the way it was pre-pandemic. And, and it, it's unclear if it will ever be exactly the same. As we know, for those of us who are fully vaccinated, it's been great to get together with family and friends and do some of the things we missed during the past year. But I think it's really important to stress that COVID continues. It continues to evolve. It continues to mutate. It continues to bring us additional challenges that might have been hard to predict in the very beginning. And it continues to affect the way that we live, the way we work, the way we play, the way we interact with each other. And the Delta variant has dealt us yet another curveball in terms of thinking about this disease and our response to this disease. And even when the current pandemic ends, it's very likely that the virus will remain endemic in our society, like the flu and like many other respiratory viruses which come and go uh, in our society. So today we're very fortunate to have three Hutch researchers who've been studying various aspects of COVID-19 and are here to share their latest insights and to answer your questions. So I'd like to start off, start off by introducing Dr. Trevor Bedford. Um, if you're somebody who likes to read the news and likes to read Twitter, you're very familiar with Trevor's name and his work. Trevor is an associate professor in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division at the Fred Hutch. He's an associate professor of Public Health Sciences Division at the Fred Hutch. He's also an associate professor in the Human Biology Division at the Fred Hutch, and we are delighted um, that Trevor is here. He works as a computational biologist. He's the co-founder of NextDrain, which is a tool that tracks in real time how viruses change as they spread through populations. So really a, a, a molecular a genomic epidemiologist. And he's closely tracking very small changes 
in the virus's genetic code that creates variants. And so your opportunity to ask perhaps the world's greatest expert on this viral evolution is something which I would hope you all can take advantage of in the Q&A uh, function. Scientists and public health officials are among the hundreds of thousands of people who obsessively follow uh, Trevor on Twitter for his insight. So Trevor, these are always great opportunities for us to talk and I feel I learn uh, so much from you every time we have a chance to have one of these interactions. So thank you. Now I'm also gonna point out both Trevor and I chose to go to the barber this week and we're sporting new hairstyles. So we have that in common as well. So Trevor, if you could give us an overview of where we are in the pandemic, both now nationally and globally. Um, um, yeah, always a pleasure to, to talk with you. Um, so when I think about where we are nationally and globally, everything revolves around Delta. Um, and that has just been remarkable and how quickly it's taken off. So across the entire world, about three quarters of COVID cases of SARS-CoV-2 is Delta. And about 85, 90% of US right now is Delta. That happened in the course of like basically March to today, which is way faster than we see kind of generally um, variants emerge in other diseases and take off and spread. Like for instance, influenza, when you have a new vaccine, a new drifted strain that they need to make a vaccine to, et cetera, that takes generally about three years to emerge and, and take off rather than just a, a few months. So this, uh, um, this rapid spread of Delta has been remarkable. It's driving state level epidemics now across the country. I, I expect that the states with less vaccination will kind of peak higher and states with, um, with more vaccination will peak lower, but we're still on track right now to have higher caseloads in King County in the next um, few weeks than we saw in the middle of winter, which is, which is remarkable. Um, I generally, uh, expect that we can have a lot of cases that will, will happen in, in King County and in the U.S. Uh, in the following weeks. There should be many fewer deaths, um, in large part because the vaccines work well, the cases are largely in the unvaccinated population, and the unvaccinated population really trends, tends to be much younger than the, than the vaccinated population. So we can expect lots of cases, fewer deaths. Um, and then globally, we're seeing that Delta is driving epidemics and countries that had successfully suppressed COVID in its earlier form. So we have places like Thailand and Vietnam that basically had, had very little circulation and are now seeing epidemics, not on the par with some other countries, but still sizable epidemics at this point. So I guess, Trevor, one question, is it the, is it the Delta virus that's dramatically different or is it the, the population that's being infected that's dramatically different? I had an argument with a family member at a at a uh, uh, at a dinner, where the argument was about is this virus itself more virulent? We know it spreads faster. Is it more virulent? Is it less virulent? How much of this is the population versus the virus? Yeah. So um, so there's a few key um, mutations in Delta that make it more transmissible. The uh, it's not 100% clear on this. The hypothesis is that. It is more transmissible because it gets to higher viral loads within individuals. It's better at attaching to cells and better at replicating and so forth. And so you get people that are infected by Delta will be breathing out more virus um, than people not. And it also tends to ramp to higher viral loads more quickly. So you're more, you're more contagious earlier in the course of illness, which helps with spread as well. And um, uh, a knock on effect there is that generally we see that higher viral loads are associated with more severe infections. So there's a number, a decent number of good studies here. I'm thinking of Public Health Scotland, um, as well as Public Health England, um, as well as Israel, where uh, you can look at how the fraction of cases that go on to be hospitalized, and you see about a 2x increase of Delta cases that go on to be hospitalized once you control for age and vaccination status and other things. So, uh, so, by having higher viral loads, it becomes much more infectious and somewhat more um, severe. So yeah, roughly 2x more likely to be hospitalized than, than um, previous form. Okay, and Trevor, were you surprised by the emergence of Delta? Did you think when you, when you looked at the, uh, at the structure of, of the original uh, uh, variant, uh, of the original uh, alpha or whatever it's called, the, 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 the one we had initially, 
Um, did you think, gosh, a few changes to the spike protein would be enough to change infectivity? Is that something you worried about? The yeah, if we if we like kind of think of a timeline here, back in like um, I don't know October 2020, uh, there wasn't really a lot going on with the virus with SARS-CoV-2. There's a few mutations, not very many. I expected it to be like seasonal coronaviruses or like one of the weaker flus mutate a bit. We have to update the vaccines every three or so years. Not not so bad. Then we had the initial variants of concern emerge, like alpha, beta, gamma. And those those kind of appeared with all of these mutations all at the same time, like really remarkable, kind of obviously something going on there. And then just by seeing kind of how rapidly they displaced other diversity, that kind of let us know that something's going on. Um, uh, however, Delta was a little um, funny this way in that it actually has fewer mutations than alpha, beta, or gamma. And the mutations aren't in some of the key residues that you might that we were like honing in on from the other VOCs. So if you just looking at the sequences, I did not think that delta would be what it is compared to alpha, beta, gamma. And then by having this massive epidemic in India, it wasn't clear whether that was driven by delta or something else. And so it was only really wanted once you started having these kind of delta upticks that were um, uh, a spillover from the Indian epidemic that it kind of became clear uh, really how much more transmissible and fit it was than uh, the other variants of concern. And so then, Trevor, the natural question becomes, how worried are you about what's next? Because, you know, we hear about Lambda, we hear about other variants that are out there. What What is your radar screen make you worried about? Yeah. Um, so of everything that is currently circulating, Delta looks like the worst or the, the worst thing. Um, you can kind of gauge that basically by you look within countries that have both say Lambda and Delta and you see which one is is winning and kind of Delta is currently out competing, out competing everything. Um, I'm not panicked about Delta, like the we our vaccination is is doing its thing and so forth. Uh, the longer term horizon is is a little scary. Um, so we don't have anything like this that's circulating. So um, there's this concept of R0, of the number of um, secondary infections that one infection causes, that gives you an idea of how hard it is to control um, a epidemic spread. And so flu R0 is about two. Um, uh, COVID started out as three, maybe three and a half, and now it's maybe five or six with, with Delta. It's unclear if it caps out at seven, eight, like we don't really know how many, how much more legs it has there. It is perhaps as evolvable as influenza, where we can expect it to kind of be evolving to escape immune response. And it, um, and it has a higher um, IFR um, infection to fatality ratio than flu, perhaps two or five hold higher, something like that. So the kind of something to live with and something to we uh, like the only thing really going for us then is we have a really good vaccine. Um, so kind of imagine kind of this really large COVID season um, threatening um, every year into the future that people need to get vaccinated for, just like we get vaccinated from influenza to reduce um, mortality and morbidity, but that it will be something that we're, um, that is not like existential in, in threat, but is um, is something that demands a, uh, consistent kind of public health resolve um, to to deal with. And, and so, Trevor, the uh, question about boosters. So we have, you know, Germany has talked about uh, doing boosters for for elderly patients or people who are immunocompromised, um, and some other countries are bringing this on as a concept. Um, and yet, the WHO was calling for a moratorium on boosters until all countries can vaccinate at least 10% of their populations. Tell us where you stand on this and and what the I'm not saying there's a right answer, but but what the different answers mean. Yeah, this is, thank you. This is a really tricky question. Um, so like <laughs> the interface of morality and geopolitics, um, I don't know. And like it revolves around like, what does a country owe to its citizens versus owe to the, the world? If we try to avoid that and kind of maybe just think of a strictly utilitarian argument, and let's say our goal is to prevent deaths in the, the US. Um, in that case, if we compared our marginal gain from vaccinate, from giving a booster to someone who's, say, over 65 in the U.S., compared to vaccinating someone in, say, Mexico who hasn't been vaccinated, 
it's probably going to be better for the if for the U.S. if we want to increase de decrease deaths here to give a booster to someone in the U.S. Um, uh, but there's knock-on effects that are complicated here that uh, that really the best way to stop these variants from emerging is to vaccinate the whole world as as quickly as possible. And that generally, I think, like thinking this is zero sum is probably not the right way. That we could um, we could be ramping up production, continuing to ramp up production of the mRNA vaccines in the U.S. and be exporting them to the world and um, reduce yeah, reduce emergence of variants and generally get the pandemic under control. Yep. So, Trevor, thank you. We're going to be back with more questions. A number have already come okay. in uh, to the Q and A line that will be specifically for you. So, thank you. I want to next uh, introduce Dr. Joshua Hill. Josh is a physician researcher who studies infectious disease and works to protect cancer patients with compromised immune systems. He was also one of the first researchers to lead a clinical trial in our COVID-19 Clinical Research Center. He's leading a national study of COVID-19 vaccines in cancer patients who are undergoing stem cell transplant and CAR-T therapies. The study has already enrolled more than 80 patients at sites around the United States. Josh is an assistant professor um, in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division here at the Fred Hutch. It's terrific, Josh, to have you uh, here, and thank you for being with us today. So um, what have you learned so far about how vaccines are working in patients with normal immune systems and in patients who are post-transplant and post-CAR T? Yeah, hi, good morning, Tom, and thanks for uh, allowing me to participate in this great forum here. So excited to talk a little bit more about these issues. So yeah, we're we're rapidly uh, ramping up this study around the U.S. So it's a great opportunity to use this big infrastructure to uh, enroll a lot of patients. So far, what we're seeing is a lot of individual small studies coming out from different cancer centers around uh, the country and the world. The goal of this study is to try to enroll up to about 750 patients around the U.S. in a pretty short time frame. What that will let us do is to really zoom in on some of the granular aspects of who can respond to vaccines. When do they respond to vaccines? And so what we've learned from some of the studies that have come out so far is if you're a year or more out from active chemotherapies, from bone marrow transplant, from CAR T cell therapy and what have you, you tend to be able to mount pretty decent responses. We're seeing responses around 80%, 90%. So near approaching what we see in our healthy individuals. Despite that, many of these patients don't get quite the same levels of antibodies. We don't exactly know what level of antibody is enough to prevent infection, but we are starting to understand that there's what we would call a dose response relationship. So the higher antibody level that you get is more likely to uh, prevent infections. Uh, so what this study will hopefully allow us to do is to look at hey, in your earlier uh, group of patients, if you're three months out, six months out from transplant, which is when we're starting to consider vaccination, how often do you respond? What predicts whether you respond? And, some of the studies out there so far show that response rates are close to 40%, 50%. So definitely still a lot of work to do to protect our patients early on after chemotherapies and transplant. And Josh, there's a number that I seem to have seen from the oncology literature that suggests that 25% of vaccine recipients who've had intensive chemotherapy do not have significant antibodies. Is that number right or is that just one study? What's your take on what the real number is there of how vulnerable our cancer population is? Yeah, I think that's about right. We see a lot of variability depending on the specific type of cancer, the specific type of chemotherapy, but we are seeing that you know up to a quarter or a third of individuals do not make good responses and don't have the, the level of response that some of our healthy uh, individuals getting vaccines do. What we're starting to learn more about are other aspects of the immune response. So antibodies aren't everything. And so the other big aspect of controlling viral infections is your T cell response. And so more and more data are coming out now that even people that don't develop an antibody response can nonetheless develop a T cell response. And so that might not protect you from actually getting the infection, but it can protect against severe disease and getting hospitalized. Uh, et cetera. So I think there's still a lot more to learn. And I, I think the important takeaway is that there are a lot of benefits from this vaccine, even if you're not developing a, a really high antibody response. Okay. And so Josh, uh, we've just heard from Trevor that the Delta variant is particularly contagious. Uh, and I guess one of the things as a clinician that I'd like to ask you is how much of a threat does Delta pose to fully vaccinated people? And, you know, we've been seeing some examples in the media 
um, and and even in Seattle of people who were fully vaccinated who have tested positive for Delta, some who've developed infections. What are you seeing from the clinical perspective of people who are fully vaccinated and who get Delta? Yeah, I think that's a really critical question that's on lots of people's minds these days. And I think a lot of us now know people who have had breakthrough infections, and certainly we're hearing about this on the media a lot. I think the, the reality is that we're still learning exactly how often this happens and uh, what the true numerator and denominator are in this equation. But what we are seeing is that breakthrough infections are happening. They're probably a little bit more frequent uh, with Delta than what we saw in the initial clinical trials, because that variant was not really around when the uh, initial vaccine trials were occurring. Uh, so despite the fact that there may be a slight increase in the, in the risk for getting an infection despite being vaccinated, we don't think we're going to see much of an increase in the risk for progressing to hospitalization or death. So the takeaway there is that, yeah, uh, breakthrough infections can occur. This is probably going to happen in a minority of people. Um, but even if you do get infected, the vaccine is still quite effective at preventing hospitalization or death. And that's that's really where the focus needs to be, and that's critical. It's, the vaccines have turned this virus into more of a common respiratory virus that causes the common cold. So I think we can take some reassurance from that, um, but we still have to be conscious of the fact that not everyone's vaccinated, children aren't vaccinated, and we need to be very aware of that fact. Yeah, and I think, Josh, one of the things that I constantly come back to is um, that, that it's important for us to think about mitigating risk from the virus even if you're vaccinated, because not only do we worry about variant emergence, but by keeping down infection rates, even in non even in vaccinated people, will hopefully take less um, uh, less burden on our healthcare system. And I think that's really, really important. I had a discussion with a family member on the phone where the argument was made: Well, you know, people who don't get vaccinated, they're making a personal choice; they have to live with that choice. The problem is. Our nurses and doctors have to care for those patients and they put extra burden on the healthcare system so that when those of us who might need to use healthcare for cancer or for heart disease or for rheumatologic illness don't have access to, to the hospital because so much of our, so many of our resources are going to uh, care for COVID, we all have a collective interest in reducing, uh, reducing infection, even if you're vaxxed. I think that's important to, to say. So the other thing, uh, uh, Josh, question for you is right now, uh, companies are making decisions about whether to bring their workforces back. The Hutch is working very carefully um, with our infectious disease teams uh, about how we're coming back. Uh, we have the Hutch Flex Plan, where some some of our workforce will will have some degree of flexibility in whether they're in the office or whether they're home. Obviously, for our doctors, our nurses, our scientists who need to be in the Hutch, they'll be at the Hutch. Obviously, that's very, very important. Um, what, what's your thoughts about about returning to work during the pandemic? How are you looking at this as an infectious disease specialist? Sure. Well, the one thing that we've learned about this virus is that it keeps us on our toes and we have to be nimble. And so I think what we're all struggling with here is that things were really starting to open up. We were opened up on the front touch campus. Life was getting back to normal again. And now we're starting to tail things back as things change. So. I think being flexible and being nimble is key as, as we've kind of been doing here on campus. Um, but also understanding that we've learned strategies for those of us that can work remotely, we've really learned how to do that in a really effective way. So I think that's important that we have those approaches that we can fall back on for people that are able to. And for individuals that aren't able to work remotely in, in those occupations, I think the key is that we also know strategies to protect ourselves and those individuals when they're on site at work. So I think. Uh, keeping those aspects in mind is key and, and following you know, the data and what's happening from a public health perspective are going to be important. And just having that kind of flexibility in, in the way that we approach this and, and how the workspace is organized and set up is going to be really critical. So, Josh, thank you very much. We're going to have you come back in just a second after we hear from uh, Alpina uh, with lots of questions. I want to thank everyone. Uh, folks are lighting up the uh, Q&A uh, tab. We're getting lots and lots of excellent questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Alpana uh, Wagmare. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division here at the Fred Hutch. Most importantly for the audience, she is a pediatrician. And when I think about the focus now of Delta and of where we are for questions as, as a society, so much of what we're questioning 
it's about children. It's just terrific, uh, Alpana, that you're able to join us uh, today. Um, her research focuses on respiratory infections in children and adults who've undergone stem cell transplantation. She's expanded her research to study the effects of COVID-19 on children with compromised immune systems, and she's very involved in testing the Pfizer vaccine in children who are under 12. So again, we could probably spend the rest of the entire hour uh, talking to you about children and COVID. And I wanna start off by saying, by asking you the question, is COVID-19 more dangerous for kids now with Delta than it was at the start of the pandemic? Um, and, and tell us a little bit about how you view this. Yeah, sure, uh, and thanks again, Tom, for having me. Um uh um at this panel so i think there the question has sort of two parts to it i think in some ways yes in some ways no i'll start with no because um uh it is a little bit of a silver lining i mean we're more than 18 months into this pandemic and we have a lot of information about how to protect kids in terms of masking ventilation indoor versus outdoor locations um and then on top of that we have highly effective vaccines one of which is available down to age 12. So I think those are all the good things and sort of where we are, um, how I would say we're in a better place than we were at the start of the pandemic when there really were a lot of unknowns. On the flip side, as you mentioned, Delta has really changed the pandemic for kids. Um, as others have said, it's highly transmissible. And um, what we have seen across the country and um, even other parts of the world is that uh, having a highly transmissible virus increases the community spread. And when you have high community spread of, of uh, COVID, you will see more infections in children. And then to go further with that, once you have more infected children, uh, the uh, percentage of those kids that get sick and require hospitalization will go up. And we're seeing that, and you're seeing that in the media, especially in uh, areas of the country that have lower vaccination rates than we do, where we're seeing um, Hearing reports of children's hospitals being, you know, filled up and in, in that capacity and at, at levels um, that were higher than sort of uh, earlier or at really any point in the pandemic. What's not totally clear yet is whether Delta actually causes more severe disease in kids um, than than um, other variants. Um, I think there have been data from other parts of the world that have suggested that the that there is. Um, uh, worse disease with Delta, but then there have been other studies that have shown that perhaps it's 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 not. So I, I'm really not sure about that yet. I think the next couple of weeks and hopefully with some of our own U.S. data, we'll be able to answer that question more clearly. But um, but it's um, it's certainly a concern that we're seeing more spread. And I think the other part that makes this point of the pandemic dangerous and, and sort of unfortunate is just we're not seeing the level of vaccination that we would like across the country to really protect kids by um, preventing community spread. And, and Dr. Wagmay, when do you expect COVID-19 vaccines to be approved for children under 12? And, and you know, again, I'm an adult physician, take care of grownups, and I'm thinking, well, gosh, why don't we just approve these for children now? Um, and what are the hurdles and what are the things we've got to see? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I wish I had a definitive answer on this. Um, I don't. I have some idea of kind of the factors at play. Um, one thing that's clear is that we don't we won't have vaccines by the time of school. And of course, across the country, there are schools that are starting this week. And so um, kids are going to be going into school without a vaccine available under 12. Over 12, there's a vaccine. And so that is uh, one bit of good news. Um, for the two manufacturers of the mRNA vaccine um, that are further furthest along in developing vaccines for uh, younger kids, um, recently the FDA asked the manufacturers to expand uh, the size of the cohort of, of patients being studied, as well as asked for kind of um, a longer um, safety data than had been previously uh, decided upon. Yeah, I think those uh, requests are certainly well-intentioned. We all want a safe vaccine in children. Um, I think the challenge, though, is that I, would, I really do worry about what that will, uh, what kind of delay that will cause in getting vaccines to kids uh, under 12. So, um, you know, I think this is a challenging thing. We obviously want a safe vaccine, uh, but we also need people to trust the vaccine. So we need um, really you know, high level of assurance that it's it's a safe and uh, effective vaccine. And so, um, you know, the other issue is that camps have been open 
this summer. Parents are getting ready to send their kids back to school. Um, you know, my, my, as I think I've said to this group many times, my daughter is an assistant principal of a middle school in, in Dallas. Um, and they actually just um, announced that the Dallas Independent School District, where she works, um, has decided to, to violate the ban on masks, uh, masking requirements that the governor has said, setting up a political confrontation between the superintendent of schools and the governor of the state of Texas um, about masking. Can you talk a little bit about masking in the, in the elementary school and in the middle school uh, realm? In middle school, there are not too many kids are back still, even though they're mostly over 12. Comment a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I do want to make one point, uh, just that, you know, I think um, pediatricians, of course, not just me, but many uh, national societies have really emphasized the importance of getting kids back into in-person school. So we know that there are academic setbacks, but there's you know, tremendous social and emotional setbacks that uh, have occurred over the year with remote learning, especially for younger kids, especially for um, kids coming from uh, communities of color where we've seen that uh, remote learning has really exacerbated inequities. So I just wanted to make that, that point clear that you know, in-person le learning is definitely important. Um, in terms of how to protect kids, um, you know, I think, it's really unfortunate um, that um, that so much of the decisions or um, that there's so much political background to some of these decisions. I mean, I think to me, it's perfectly clear that masking will protect kids, uh, both vaccinated and unvaccinated kids. So I, for, to me, that's not really um, a question. Um, and I feel really, it feels disheartening to hear sort of these the stories like you mentioned about your, your daughter's school. I mean, it just seems crazy to me. But, um, but you know, masking, I think, will definitely help. I think uh, increasing vaccination rates among those that are eligible, but among staff and uh, adolescents is the other key. And then um, really, you know, there's a lot in that the CDC has provided around guidance regarding ventilation and sort of how to protect uh, kids in school, but keep them in school, uh, not only to start school, but also uh, continue in school, even if we do see cases um, pop up and um, uh, and how to deal with those. Great. So I'd like to bring up a thank you so much. I'd like to, to bring Josh Trevor back. We have approximately 35 questions that have come in, uh, which is terrific. I keep encouraging you to bring more of them in. I'm going to go by, uh, try to get as many of these answered as we possibly can. Um, they're great questions. They're really fantastic. Uh, and there'll be questions for all of our panelists as we move forward. So I'd like to start with a um, question uh, which asks, is, and this is for Alpana, is it now risky for vaccinated grandparents to visit young, unvaccinated grandchildren. What's your take on that? And how would you do that? Yeah, the way I uh, would approach that is, um, I think there has to be some consideration for the individual family um, and sort of what the underlying diseases that a particular um, family or you know the children in that family might have. If there is a reason to think that they might be at higher risk they're immunocompromised, um, et cetera, you know, those are things that really, need, you know, each individual family should be considering. Um, and then it also depends on the risk behavior, I guess, of the whole family. Um, are are the vaccinated grandparents, you know, doing, you know, going to, <laughs> to big uh, events that are where they're unmasked and um, around people that are unvaccinated? So, you know, those are the types of considerations that I would uh, take into play. If it's a grandparent that is uh, vaccinated and continues to, to mask and, and take precautions and, and generally trying to avoid exposures, then I think, you know, I'm I'm not ready to um, say that they shouldn't be visiting unvaccinated kids based on what we know. But again, I think some of these things are kind of individual families um, uh, will have to make these decisions. And I, I don't want you to think all, but that all the questions are pediatrics, but a lot of them are pediatrics. So I'm <laughs> going to give you a couple more while we're at sure, it. Sure, no problem. Um, so thoughts on flying this fall with children who are too young to be vaccinated. What's your take on, on the risk of flying with little kids? Yeah, I mean, the, um, uh, I think that's a good question. I, it, 
unfortunately, I don't have a kind of a blanket answer for that. Again, I think it really can, comes down to what your uh, individual family's risk is and sort of tolerance to risk is. Um, I think that if it's a short flight and you have uh, the ability for the kids to, you know, maintain their masking, um, I think that would be, you know, reasonable for most families to consider. Um, but, but it also depends where you're flying to. Right? I mean, if you're going into um, a higher risk area, that would be the other consideration to think about. Great, thank you. So, Trevor, this is this one's for you. Um, anything about the Delta variant that impacts what we know about transmission indoors or outdoors? Yeah. Um, so, the hypothesis that I think is pretty strong. Uh, is that it's all about viral load. It's not that kind of somehow the physical virion is more stable or something like this. It's really kind of how much virus people are breathing out when they're they're infected. And so that can make situations where like if there was um, uh, six feet, 10 minutes sort of contact, et cetera, um, that with original virus, you might not have had a transmission event, whereas with um, with Delta, you would. So you can kind of think of these borderline situations. But kind of the strategies that we've figured out for how to reduce uh, reduce spread should be the same. Um, so outdoors, et cetera. And I would I would, given by how little outdoor transmission we observed with um, original virus, it like um, there shouldn't be so much with Delta. But there should be some, you know, some uptick. But I would still think that it is, um, it is largely safe um, uh, to be outdoors. And Trevor, a follow-up question for you as well, which is the uh, the viral load for vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. This was something that seemed to play uh, have a lot of importance to the CDC's thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is that has been. Um, study is saying different things um and it's not i'm not exactly clear where things fall at the moment um earlier on we had most studies saying that viral load of breakthrough infections were um was significantly lower and um more recent work is there's other studies saying that it seems to be equivalent um with the sequencing work that we're doing or the work that we're doing with seattle flu study we're seeing largely similar viral loads between the breakthrough infections and the non-breakthrough infections um, so, so that even if breakthrough infections, and then you'll see there's this nice study out of Singapore where um, you see initially viral loads quite similar, and this might be explaining some of the discrepancies. Initially, you see viral loads quite similar, but then immunity is kicking in in the vaccinated individuals and kind of bringing the um, infection down more quickly. So you see kind of higher viral loads for longer in the um, unvaccinated individuals, higher viral loads, and high kind of similarly high viral loads initially for vaccinated individuals that rapidly. Um, deplete. And so that that probably, yeah, probably explains most of things. Okay. And so uh, thank thank you, Trevor. Josh, um, question, and there's actually several questions like this, and, and Alpana, you might have a, um, a perspective on this as well. So um, Josh, what are your thoughts on, on women who are looking to get pregnant, but are concerned about the vaccine um, at the time they're thinking of getting pregnant? So I guess the question to you would be, is there any evidence of any reproductive ab uh, disadvantage to getting vaccinated while you're trying to get pregnant? And Alpana, is there any evidence that if you are pregnant already and 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 have a have a a, a baby in utero, um, is there any evidence that there's any danger to being vaccinated in that setting? Josh, and then Alpana. Sure, and thanks for bringing up that question. I think it's an important one. And uh, in the initial trials, pregnant women were excluded, and that's part of the typical approach for clinical trials with new medications, but of course left a lot of people out there wondering what the best approach was. What we do know uh, definitively is that pregnant women who get infected with COVID-19 have worse outcomes and have quite severe outcomes often. And this is something we've seen with other respiratory viruses. So there is a real risk there of getting an infection while pregnant. And subsequent data since the clinical trials were performed have shown that some people that got pregnant while on those clinical trials had healthy, uh, normal babies. And we haven't seen any risk factors for getting vaccinated while you're either trying to get pregnant or while you are pregnant. So there have been follow-up studies that have shown this to be quite safe. And I think uh, really important for pregnant women to get vaccinated because of their specifically 
increased risk for bad outcomes. So that's my take on it. I'd love to hear what uh, Alpana thinks as well. Yeah, no, um, not much that. I totally agree. I mean, the the risk of getting COVID and having severe disease while pregnant is significant. And um, there is no um, data to suggest that there's a risk to the mother or um, the, the infant by getting vaccinated. And certainly the the largest um, uh, professional group, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, has recommended all pregnant women get vaccinated. Great. So, Trevor, um, you mentioned an R0 of 5 to 6 for Delta. Is the R0 the same for vaccinated and unvaccinated people? Um, the the technical definition of R0 or R0 is, uh, is you have a new virus in the population. You have someone who's infected, having given kind of normal behavior patterns, et cetera, they're going to be making contacts, and it's how many people do they spread it to. And so, um, so that is R0 in specific, and that, that necessarily says that people are not vaccinated and that we're not doing this giant societal mitigation. And it's kind of what you'd think the virus to naturally do if we weren't trying to do anything to combat it. Uh, then we have RT, um, or sometimes RE for our effective. That is kind of currently right now, if you have someone in the population that's infected and society is behaving as it is, and we have a certain amount of immunity from natural infection vaccination, how many people are they getting sick? And if um, RT, until Delta, um, or recently, um, uh, in like April, uh, was firmly below one, and we had an epidemic that was dying out in the um, in the U.S. Uh, Delta has flipped that so that um, transmission is largely in the unvaccinated um, uh, individuals. RT is now 1.2, maybe 1.3 ish, and that that's why we have this this growing um, growing wave. We'll expect that to create enough uh, population immunity and the unvaccinated uh, individuals, that then RT will again, again drop below one and it will kind of come back down. So we have this kind of constant dynamic interplay between what the virus is doing, uh, population immunity and, and behavior. Great, thanks Trevor. So um, this could really go to any of you and I, I think I'm gonna give this one to Alpana uh, to start with. Um, and it comes down to the fact that um, depending upon the week, uh, whether it's Fox News or CNN, um, you'll see a tremendous amount of criticism of the CDC, depending upon what the topic happens to be. And so there's a lot of criticism on the inconsistency of what we're hearing from the CDC. Now, I had the the, the real privilege of working um, with uh, Dr. Walensky when she was at MGH and I was at MGH. I know her to be an outstanding physician scientist who really does care. Um, and yet it's hard, I think, for people to understand that sometimes data changes. And so, Alpana, how do you advise people to look at the advice from the CDC? Are you frustrated by it as a pediatrician in this area? How do you sort of look at this data inconsistency problem? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think uh, to me, um, some of it is also in in the messaging, both directly from the CDC, but also um, with the with the way the media reports on it. Um, it's really unfortunate, I think, when they uh, use work words like backtracking or reversing recommendations, because to me, I mean, I think, um, you know, we are following the science and we're learning more, obviously, every day. And so that messaging around, um, you know, using that word of like changing their minds or sort of backtracking is is challenging, I think, for sure. Um, that being said, um, you know, I, I think it is a challenge. These are challenging messages to get across. And there's so many. Um, so many nuances, right? And uh, trying to convey those has definitely been a challenge, I think, for the CDC. And I, I, you know, I, I think they're doing the best they can, but um, that's sort of an inherent um, aspect of the pandemic that things are challenging and changing and, and hard to relay to the general population. Yeah, I think understanding that change is part of the process of a pandemic uh, is, is important and hard for people to get their arms around, which is difficult. So Josh, this next one is for you. Um, I'm a sports fan. This isn't for me, but it's in the in the list as well. But it's I'm kind of modifying one of the questions. I'm a big sports fan. I really love watching sports. Um, and uh, many of you may know that that uh, um, Lamar Jackson, who's a quarterback for the uh, for the the Baltimore Ravens, really good player, 
um, just had his second bout of COVID and has said that he will not be getting the vaccine um, and has made that personal decision. Um, does that make sense that you've had two bouts of COVID, you therefore have an incredibly strong immune system? Is there anything more to gain if you've had one bout of COVID or two bouts of COVID? How do you advise people who have survived the infection with relatively modest side effects? Um, what do you tell them about getting a vaccination? Yeah, it's a it's a challenging question, um, and one would like to think that after having to go through the ordeal of getting the infection, that you might be even more motivated to get a vaccine. But I think the key there is is educating people about what the potential risk benefit there is, and some data that's come out of the Hutch and from other collaborators has shown that you might actually get a broader immune response and a different type of immune response to the vaccine than you do with natural infection, and it's. It's hard to think that we've actually improved on, you know, nature and what the actual infection itself can do for boosting immunity. But certainly the vaccine does have uh, additional benefits beyond uh, the primary infection. So I think there is a key motivation there that people should be getting uh, the vaccine and that it can protect you additionally from getting future infections. So, yeah, I, I think there is a lot of uh, merit there. And we do encourage people to get vaccinated, even if they've had prior infection. So move to Trevor with this question, because Trevor, there was a time when you spent a lot of your focus thinking about testing. So if you think about it, we have three tools to fight COVID. We've got, well, we have therapeutics as well. I won't count therapeutics at this point, but, but test, vax, and mask. We've been spending a lot of time focusing on vaxing, a lot of time on masking. Can you talk about what you think the role of testing is? In, in fighting this pandemic. And I know in your earlier career, and I know it doesn't seem like it's that long ago, but when you were a flu guy, which wasn't that long ago, Trevor, okay? Testing was a big part of what you were talking about. Tell us a little about where testing sits now with COVID and why it's important and why it's not important. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think that like it is a orthogonal strategy to um, to vaccination and masking that has, like you pay the cost in PCR reagents, et cetera, but it's it's like something that we should be able to afford as a society to be able to to do that and to have abundant testing that's very um very kind of easy to easy to access. It it really should help. Um there's something the contact tracing side of that should really improve things and should be a thing that works well. It's been really challenging for basically the US public health system to make that to make that work. And so that's kind of Partly, what's made it um, made it more difficult to to function well. Um, so that testing is largely about kind of confirming that it's COVID, and you can, you really should isolate rather than actually kind of quarantining people that were were exposed. Um, so I think it it should obviously it should be a real strategy. Um, it it does really help. Uh, Delta has um, made this more challenging than it had been in that if we have a shorter generation time, so you kind of ramp to infection more quickly, it makes that kind of that timeline that you have to follow to um, to quarantine and isolate uh, even more challenging for Delta. Um, but I, I do think it should absolutely be a, a tool that we have going forward. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. So, uh, Alpana, this one's for you. Um, and I want to thank the, the participants for the questions. The questions have been absolutely fantastic. Um, and this was kind of alluded to, but I want to just make sure we're clear on this because a lot of questions coming in around around parenting and questions like that. So this has, have there been any studies on breastfeeding moms who've been vaccinated and the level of protection it provides babies? Yeah, um, so there have been studies looking at, so we're talking about vaccinated or infected uh, COVID positive, I mean, sorry, mothers and the levels of antibodies in the breast milk. Um, so I think, you know, I would say that the um, there have been studies that have looked at uh, antibodies basically in breast milk for COVID and for other respiratory viruses. But certainly people have been doing that for a long time and have found that there are um, uh, levels. What we don't know for sure is what protection that provides um, uh, to the infant. And especially for COVID, I don't think I've seen any great data really showing that. It's a hard thing to show. but. Um, but we know that there is there are antibodies in breast milk, and um, I would hope that that would provide some uh, protection for the infant as well. I just don't think that those studies have yet been done. 
And have we seen infections in infants? We have seen infections in infants, um, not common, I would say. Um, and I think, you know, during most of the past 18 months of the pandemic, I think most uh, parents have kept their infants pretty well isolated and protected like normally people do with their infants anyways. But we have seen cases in Seattle. And um, if you look at the national data, certainly there is a uh, there is a group there that's um, uh, uh, that's positive. Um, I think there because the numbers are pretty small, it's hard to say definitely if they've had more severe disease. Um, there have been instances where we've seen that here in Seattle, but um, we do see infection in infants. Okay, Josh, question for you. Um, tell us about long haulers. Has this turned out to be uh, to be accurate, is it this, is it something that we should be concerned about um, now that we've had 18 months to follow the impact of of infection on people? What do we know about long haulers? Yeah, I think this is definitely uh, something at the top of people's minds that even if they do get infected and have a relatively mild course, what we're learning is that you can nonetheless have these really prolonged symptoms that we're still trying to get a handle on. But, but certainly there is this potential new wave of what might, one might call a new crisis of these long-term symptoms that people are really suffering from. So trying to get a better handle on that is gonna be really important, um, but we are seeing more and more reports of that. Uh, more work is definitely needed to better understand what are the risk factors and how do we prevent it. And so I think a key that we haven't really talked much about in this venue today are other therapeutics besides vaccines, right? I think I've seen a few questions that have come up uh, about that, but certainly there's still a huge amount of attention being paid to developing medications that can treat people who get infected despite being vaccinated or, or not vaccinated. So I think that's really gonna be key is that alongside the vaccine discussion, we are still paying a lot of attention to develop a pill that we can give people early on in the course of an infection to reduce the risk that they get more sick or that they develop these long-term. Okay, and I'll put another question for you about the mental and medical disadvantages of kids wearing masks all day long. Someone actually asked about the idea that does it reduce their ability to breathe in terms of oxygen levels? Um, I know, for example, when I was running or trying to play tennis with a mask, I found it kind of challenging. It wasn't, wasn't very pleasant to do either of those two things with a mask. What about kids who are running around a lot? Any medical issues? And then someone, someone else asked about the emotional issues of wearing a mask all day long? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a good question and it's a fair concern, I think, that most adults have about kids. But, you know, the thing is that kids are resilient. Um, they can do this. I mean, my kids wear masks all day long and they're fine. <laughs> and I, I think that most parents of young kids will tell you the same, that, you know, they can do it. They they know that they need to and they know that they need to in order to do the things that they want to do, like go to school and play with their friends. And, um, you know, I, I have really no concerns about anything to do with um, oxygen or any sort of medical um, challenges by wearing masks. Um, I mean, I think there for really young kids, you know, I think there is potentially um, some suggestions that, you know, the inability to see faces, for example, may um, be something that needs to be watched. But that's mostly what happens between an, uh, either um, a primary caregiver or a parent and the infant, not like sort of um, what we're worried about in school age children, I think. So um, to me, I don't I don't personally think that the masks have any uh, pose any significant challenges to children. OK, thank you. So this next question is for both Josh and Trevor. You've got three groups of people, cancer patients getting active cancer therapy, bone marrow transplant patients, and then patients who've got MS or rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, that are on a immunosuppressive medicine, those three populations. For Trevor, is there any test they could get to try to find whether or not they have neutralizing antibodies or significant antibodies that could protect them? And for Josh, any evidence therapeutically that those patients should be getting antibody infusions prophylactically uh, to protect them. Trevor. Uh, yeah, uh, so we have from a number of uh, kind of the studies that I look at where you have uh, these kind of classic assays where you take 
antibodies or take um, sera from a um, from a convalescent individual or someone who has been vaccinated, you can take that sera and titer it down so you're at like one to forty concentration, one to eighty concentration, one to one sixty concentration, and you see how well do the antibodies in that sera uh, stop or kill virus if you kind of put it in a in a in a dish, and so very classic lab technique to see how how effective your your antibodies are. That seems to correlate well with immunity as um, as far as we understand it. Uh, I think it's a good assay. I have no idea how available that assay is to to an individual. Um, I haven't I haven't looked into that at all. Okay. And Josh, could you address the question of a Have you seen your patients be able to get that assay? Two. What about the use of antibodies in those three separate populations? Yeah, yeah, I can help address some of those. So there, is, there are a number of commercially available assays that can be ordered for general antibody titers. Those aren't the neutralizing antibodies, the functional antibodies that Trevor's mentioning. Those are not really available commercially and are pretty labor intensive. They appear to correlate pretty well, but what we still don't know is what level of antibody is protective. And so we don't routinely recommend that our patients get them. Uh, we do oftentimes order them on case by case basis with you know appropriate discussions. But we're hoping to see soon from researchers at the Hutch and others what what antibody titer does correlate with reduction in, in your risk for infection. I think those data are hopefully going to be coming out soon to better be able to interpret that result when we give it to somebody. Uh, as far as the question of prophylactic antibody infusions, that's a great one. Uh, it's an extremely challenging uh, approach to take. So. We do it in certain patient populations who have congenital problems with their immune system. They might get monthly infusions of, of antibodies that come from donors. Um, we do it after you know, certain types of chemotherapies as well. Uh, you know, the, in the past year or two or three, we've been plagued by national shortages of those and blood products in general. So doing that in approach warrants uh, study and it's being investigated. Uh, but it's very challenging to do that on a, on a routine basis and to have product and, and to have access to that. Even just giving uh, infusions of antibodies for patients that are sick with COVID and high risk uh, is something we're doing, but it's, it's difficult. So it's, it's worth investigating, but I think we need better approaches. So Alpana, Josh, Trevor, we could probably talk for another hour. I want to thank the three of you for a fabulous discussion and thank all of you who are with us today. Uh, for coming. I want to remind everyone that Obliteride is on August 14th, which is less than a week away. It's just this Saturday. Uh, you'll be, and we really, it's not too late to sign up. You'll be joining nearly 5,000 people from 50 states and 40 countries who are running, walking, hiking, reading poetry, and a myriad of other activities to support research at the Fred Hutch. This is our biggest year ever in terms of participation and we would love to get as many people as possible to do this. I'll be on my bike as well on August 14th, and so will many of my colleagues here at the Fred Hutch. And you can learn more at www.obliteride.org. Our science says we'll be back in early October with a focus on how we're taking our expertise in curing blood cancers and applying it to solid tumors like breast, lung, and prostate. And of course, we will continue to do programs which address the latest with COVID-19. In the meantime, I hope everyone enjoys what's what remains of the summer. They say, stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you in October, if not before. Thank you so much.